All right, I'll go ahead and get started. I know people will come in, but uh, I'm Jim Wheelis, so good to be here. And uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of, uh, and mainly leave a lot of time for questions of how we make medication decisions when we approach patients with epilepsy or kind of how we fit the right medicine to the right patient, which you hear a lot about in the modern world, but this is really what's called precision medicine, right? <laughs> is getting the right medicine for the right patient. So let me just maybe start at the beginning and just remind folks, and we'll get to the medicines quickly. Um, there's a lot of aspects of treatment. Um, once we make the diagnosis, medical therapy is kind of what almost universally everybody ends up on initially at least. Um, and you know, hopefully that works. Hopefully we make the right choices. And if we don't, uh, you know, we kind of do evaluation to figure out options uh, as well. But we're going to just be talking about the medical side of it uh, for my, uh, my uh, time here as well. Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on. All right, so this is the obvious one, which years ago we used to get this question. So I remember years ago people asking, like, oh, what's the best medicine for epilepsy? Uh, and that was when we had four medicines. <laughs> so um, maybe it was a little bit simpler question then, but there really was no kind of what's the best medicine or what's the only medicine. It's like, okay, it's whatever works best for you is the best medicine. Uh, and nowadays that we have lots of choices, uh, clearly um, this is not a cookie cutter approach. There's not one medicine that fits everybody. That's uh, so we have to think about it uh, with medical therapy. There's a lot of options. So if you look just since 1990, uh, these are all our options to treat epilepsy. So the good news is uh, we have more options than ever, and we can hopefully tailor these and fit one to the right patient where they tolerate the medicine, it works for their seizures, and it helps them out. Uh, the bad news is now that we have so many choices, uh, many of our colleagues that don't do epilepsy full time have kind of tossed up their hands because they said we can't figure out which one to pick. And so unfortunately, they're just using a couple of medicines out of the long list that, that they feel comfortable with and not kind of you know, using the full gamut of, of medicines that are available. So uh, I think it's, the, it's a good news, but it also requires a little bit more. Um, the other thing that you really have to keep in mind as we get new medicines is when medicines are approved, all we know is what's based on their approval, which is very little. And then after they've been on the market for a long time, we learn far more. Unfortunately, what is in the label is just the little yellow circle because it's based on what's approved. And all the other data is never included in anything that you look up when you look at the label or when the pharmacy gives you the handy medication guide, which is far more information than is in the label. Um, and literally, for some of our medications, just to give you an example, when the drug is approved, there may be literally a handful of publications, and five to ten years later, that could be in the upwards of hundreds of publications. And none of that is in any of the pharmacy information that patients get. And hopefully your doctors are keeping up with it, and they have it. But you have to keep this in mind. There's far more that we learn kind of as medicines are on the market than we know when they first show up. All right, so what about medications? I just Before we get into specific medications, I just want to remind you about a couple of things that I think get confused a lot. So we're using medications to treat the symptom, which is the seizure. We're not curing epilepsy. Now, treating it is great, don't get me wrong. Not having seizures is great, but we're just suppressing the symptom, which is why the name was changed years ago from anti-epileptic medication to anti-seizure medication. So we're stopping the seizures. If we look at the most common seizure type, and we look in adults, which is the bulk of our population of patients with seizures, because you spend more time as an adult than you do as a kid. <laughs> um, they occur in kids. So if we look at focal seizures uh, in anti-seizure medications, this is an often quoted study that Martin Brody did out of Glasgow, Scotland. He was able to do this because Martin had paper charts before anybody had electronic charts. Um, if you live in Glasgow and you live in Scotland, uh, you have to go to the National Health Service hospitals. You can't go somewhere else. You can track everybody. Uh, and he was seeing everybody that had epilepsy in his area over years and had all the records. And he excluded folks that said, okay, you're an adult and you had your seizures because you maybe partied too much on Halloween Eve and that caused you to have a seizure or you're an adult and you decided you didn't need your medicine for that month, so you had seizures. So he tried to just pick folks that, okay, we've got the right diagnosis, they're really taking their medicine, how do they do? And this is where this information came from that you can see that, you know, if you had the first drug, which is the blue, you get about half the patients, you know, if you can, your first pick, new onset focal seizures, and then the diminishing yield as you go on, 
Uh, and this kind of led to kind of where our current classification that once you get past two medicines, you're refractory and you should think about, you know, other options, you know, kind of figure things out. Keep in mind this only applies to focal seizures. So if you don't have focal seizures, this means nothing <laughs> uh, to you. Uh, but it's often misquoted as though it applies to the world of seizures, unfortunately, uh, as well. All right, so that's where this came from. Um, and it was felt as though, that, you know, why do we even try more medicines if the benefit's so low? And the analogy I always give, it's you know, kind of like the average baseball player. I mean, we have some really good baseball teams, World Series going on now. Uh, but, you know, some of the good players are only 300 hitters, and you look at how many home runs they have, and it's really dismal. So they go up to the plate a lot, they take a shot at it, but how often do they hit home runs? So uh, the same analogy I would give here, um, yes, if you failed a couple medicines, our next uh, choice next medicine it may not be great you're going to get that home run seizure freedom uh, but if you don't try you never get one uh, um, kind of thing and then the big exception to this rule if you look at all of our kind of recent new medicines again this is for focal seizures uh, in past years uh, going back to the 90s most of them run three to five percent at most chance of seizure freedom once you've you know not responded to a couple medicines Senobambi, brand name Excopri, appears to be the real exception to this rule that seems to be holding up, that seems to have dramatically higher seizure freedom rates than any other seizure medicine we've had. It had it in the trials, it seems to be holding up in the real world, so that may be an asterisk down the road for this exception to this. But the reason we keep trying is there's benefit and the risks are really pretty low uh, for serious problems. Uh, yes, we can have minor kind of, yes, they make you dizzy, tired, kind of, okay, you come off it, it goes away. But as far as serious problems, they're relatively low. So that's why we keep, keep trying. Uh, so this is why we keep trying. We talked about this, you know, seizure-free, we try and minimize side effects. Uh, if there are other conditions the patient has, if they have headaches, if they have other problems, and we'll come to that, we maybe have a new medicine that, that covers both, if you will. Uh, we may minimize kind of interactions with other drugs. Uh, for a lot of our patients, you know, just making it easier to take the medicine. So if it's once a day instead of two or three times a day, if it's less pills, we can do that. Uh, and at the end of the day, if we can't get seizure freedom, as a very minimum, we should be trying to get rid of all the seizures that cause convulsions or someone to fall because those are the ones that really end up hurting folks and potentially killing folks, which is not good. And so we try and, you know, as a minimum, we can get seizure freedom say we should at least get rid of all of those if we can. All right, so these are the questions that we face then, right? kind of where do we go first, what's the best medicine, how do we combine medicines, how do we even combine those with other medicines, because most of our patients don't just take seizure medicines and no other medicines. Uh, they take lots. So uh, this is always interesting. If you survey patients, literally, as they're leaving the doctor's office, if you say, oh, if you were just diagnosed with epilepsy or you have epilepsy, what is your goal for treatment? Uh, believe it or not, the patient's first goal is we want the medicine to work. This may seem like a shocker, <laughs> uh, but that's the first thing that they tell us. Uh, they usually say, you know, we'd like the medicine not to hurt us uh, as well as the second choice. And then the third choice is, you know, yeah, we'd like minor things not to happen to, like we don't want to feel dizzy or, you know, gain weight or whatever. Um, and then usually the fourth thing is we'd like to actually be able to take the medicine. So if it's a child, we'd like it to be in a liquid. If some adults have problems swallowing pills even, so they'd like it to be a formulation they can actually take. And we'd like it to be convenient, probably fits into this too. So, you know, once a day, twice a day. If it's a small pill, not a giganto pill, we like that. Um, so that's what patients tell us, right? It's interesting when we talk to doctors um, as well. Um, so what did the doctors tell us that they would like or how do they select medicine? Um, so we would hope that the first choice would be that it works well, right, um, for the doctor as well. Uh, we hope that's their first choice. Um, they also don't want the medicine to hurt their patients. That doesn't usually work well. Um, when we say no other side effects, uh, from the doctor's standpoint, they usually say we don't want patients calling back all the time, but that usually translates to, well, if, yeah, I'm calling because the medicine may be tired, it may be dizzy, it may be that. So you get a different view depending on who you're talking to. Uh, and the doctors would like it to be easy to prescribe. They would like to just send the prescription. There's not a long titration. There's not a lot of complicated steps. Basically, the patient can't mess it up because then they get called back. <laughs> and they're trying to avoid that. Uh, so, we, so we don't always match up 100%. We hope we do at least the top few items, right? All right, so how does the physician go about doing this? So hopefully they've made the correct diagnosis of seizure type. 
and if it's an epilepsy syndrome, they've made that. Um, they've understood kind of the different drugs. They all have different side effects, different interactions, just the properties in the medicines. Which one can you take my mouth? Which ones can you not take my mouth? Which ones do you have to take with food? Which ones do you not? Um, my bias is since we treat epilepsy uh, for years, usually, that we should take a medicine that has what we call a long half-life, so it can be given once or twice a day, it lasts long enough, or an extended release formulation should always be the first choice it's if it's available. If you're on a liquid, unfortunately in our epilepsy world, we don't have extended release liquids. There are extended release liquids in other areas of treatment. We just haven't caught up with that in epilepsy, unfortunately, for folks that can't swallow pills. Hopefully we'll get there someday <laughs> as well, because uh, we certainly have it in other areas of medicine. Uh, but the key is obviously if you want patients to take their medicine, you should make it where they can take it conveniently, right? <laughs> and it lasts in their system. Uh, and then we have to understand what's important to our patients. Uh, and I'll hit a few highlights of that so that they say, oh, this medicine fits with what I would like uh, as well. And then hopefully, once we've done all that, we've narrowed that list of you know 20 some medicines I showed you down to a handful and you start with the best one and if it works great, if not, you go to the next one on the list and kind of in a somewhat logical order, uh, approach this as well. Uh, so I'm gonna argue if you know how each anti-seizure medicine, ASM, uh, works for each epilepsy syndrome, you can do this. And I'll just give you a couple examples uh, without overwhelming you too much, and then we'll go into some much uh, maybe easier stuff as well. So let me just start with a couple uh, examples to show you how we window that list down dramatically based on the seizure type you have. Um, so let's get the top one for right now and just go to childhood absence. So a common childhood epilepsy, one of our more frequent new onsets in children, uh, but we only have three medicines that we know are kind of the best three. So this makes it easy. You go from a list of 20 down to three and say, okay, these are our best three. You should always start there. Now, they don't work 100% of the time for everybody, but they're pretty good. We probably get 80, 85%, and if we don't get there, we can go down the list. More importantly, this is probably one of the few epilepsy conditions where we actually have negative trials published. So what do I mean by that? That means that people try these medications, um, they compared them to the French drug, placebo, also known as placebo, <laughs> or a sugar pill, uh, and said, you know what, they work just as well as a sugar pill. <laughs> so we have rare instances where we know that, okay, there's no point even prescribing these medications because they do nothing, uh, and which is unusual. We don't usually publish kind of negative results in medicine, or we don't usually purposely do trials, expect, you know, it, with the goal of having a negative result. So when you do it, it's usually a surprise because that's not usually, you know, what patients want to sign up for either. Like, would you like to be in a trial with a medicine that I don't think will help you? Most patients don't really get excited about that. <laughs> so we don't usually have those. So this is a little bit unique. Um, if we kind of look at other ones, so these are more common in adolescents and adults. So epilepsy with generalized tonic or convulsive seizures or juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. You can see our list is a little bit longer for our best medicines, kind of the class one, but still it narrows that 20 some odd medicines down dramatically to a handful of medicines that we can use other factors to pick between, and I'll highlight a couple of those. Um, if we switch gears to some of our uh, kind of challenging to treat epilepsies, uh, and I'll just look at Lennox Gasteau here, because uh, really hard, mixed seizure types, very tough starts in childhood, persist to adulthood, um, we used to have no medicines. Uh, Felmate was the first one in the 90s, and now you can see we have, thankfully, a growing list of options here. We have several options for folks that desperately need it. This is really tough to treat epilepsy even with these options. Uh, so it's nice that we kind of can do that. Um, and then if we look at a couple other challenging ones, so Dervais syndrome, I think the Dervais folks are here as well. Again, for many years we had no class one, which is kind of first choice medicines if you want to think of it that way. Uh, now we have three that we know work really well there uh, also, so it, it, it is a improvement. Are we where we need to be 100%? Not by any means, but we're ahead of where we were as well. Uh, and this is the real challenging area. If you have focal epilepsies, partial epilepsies, uh, whatever name you know them by, uh, we have a long list of options since the 90s that have been approved. So this is where it gets really tough because you can say, oh, I have focal epilepsy, what medicine do I use? It's like, wow, if I have to try each one of these for four or five months to know if it works and there's this many on the list, I'm going to be really old by the time I get through this list <laughs> uh, as well. So this is where we have to kind of look at other factors to help us. And keep in mind, 
I'm going to probably spend most of the rest of the time where I'll be talking about will apply mainly to this group, but it will overlap with other groups. Um, this group gets so much attention because if we look from, you know, literally infancy to the end of the age spectrum, focal epilepsies represent the biggest bulk of all epilepsy. Probably 75, 80 percent of all adult seizures are focal epilepsies, probably half of all seizures in kids. So even if you look across the entire age spectrum, this is the bulk of epilepsy, which is why everybody gets studied there, because uh, it's the most of what we see as uh, well. All right, so let's look at a couple of the older medicines first, just to kind of make that, and I've listed at the bottom kind of the abbreviations to help you out, but phenobarbital, phenytoin, carbamase, and valproate are older medicines, the so ones that started pre-1990s, if you will. We've artificially kind of drawn a line there as we started kind of the modern era of newer medicines. You know, what, why, why do we not use them as much anymore? Well, several of them have really hard drug-drug interactions, which means if you take any other medicine, it's going to be a nightmare to regulate these. doesn't mean it can't be done. It's just really complicated. Uh, some of these just don't get absorbed in children. Uh, literally, they're, they're like a, kind of trying to swallow a rock because they're so poorly absorbed that you just get very little in your system. It kind of goes in one end and goes out the other end. Uh, some of them are challenging to dose if you're changing body size, because the, the doses change every uh, kind of with small changes in body size, so it's harder to regulate gazelle. Uh, and some of them are just not healthy for you. So we know that phenobarbital, phenytoin, carbamazepine, all can change lipids from a healthy cardiac profile to one that looks like you're going to have a heart attack. <laughs> They're really unhealthy, and just getting off those, you can fix that. Uh, several of them are not good for bone health, which if you're going to take for years is not great in the modern era. We're more focused on that. Uh, and several of them are what we call teratogenic in class, used to be called class D, the FDA has changed it, but I like the class D because this is kind of like when you were in school, the D's not good, it's not good here either. Uh, so that means that, you know, you shouldn't take them during pregnancy if you, you know, can avoid them at all. So there's a lot of reasons we've kind of moved away from these. It's not that they don't work well, it's just that there's a lot of issues and many of our newer medicines avoid these and work as well, so that's why. All right, so let's start with some of the other options that we look at. So one is just gender alone. We'd like to think that no matter what gender you are, you want your seizures controlled and you want fewer side effects, right? That should be universal. But if you're old enough, you would have to think about if you're a female, uh, can I take this with my contraception if I'm trying to avoid pregnancy? If I am pregnant, is it safe? Uh, does it cause cosmetic changes? Uh, females tend to think more about bone health than males. Unfortunately, males should, but <laughs> that's the way it works. So we have slightly different issues. Um, and we know that there are some medicines that we should not take if we are trying not to get pregnant and we don't want to end up in this waiting room. Uh, so, um, and there are some that uh, can work with our seizure medicine, so make it easier. So we know that now we have a growing list of medicine that have run oral contraceptives that will not interfere, and we did not used to have literally but one medicine we could use here years ago, so it's nice for our teenage and up female patients that if they're trying not to get pregnant, we have options uh, for them to help out with that because that becomes a real uh, kind of break point for many of our females uh, that don't want to have that. Um, and we have many medicines that will interfere, so obviously we avoid that uh, as well. And then the other question that often comes up is, okay, if I want to get pregnant, um, you know, what are our safe medicines? Unfortunately, it takes a long time to figure this out, <laughs> longer than you would think. When the medicines are approved, none of them are tested in patients that are pregnant, so we don't ever know that when medicines come out, uh, and then it usually takes upwards of a decade or longer because we have to find females that are just on one medicine because if you're taking two or three medicines, it becomes really hard to know which one affected the baby. So that makes it even longer. So it often takes a good 10, 20 years, even with national registries, to figure these things out. So we never know this in advance. We have ideas from animal studies, but if you say humans, we kind of, uh, you know, kind of have to waver a little bit there. So as we sit here today, these are the only three that have kind of been out long enough that we say they're the three safest. Now, it doesn't mean the other ones are horrible. No, it just means these are the ones we have the best data on, and we can say that they're really safe to take during pregnancy if our patients are desiring that. So that helps for some of our books. All right, what if they have other conditions? So if you have migraines and epilepsy, we have a fair number of folks that have both of those. We know that we have some medicines that can work for both. Um, I always kiddingly say that our folks that are overweight 
if you want to lose weight, I can use three medicines and get you to any weight you want, <laughs> our seizure medicines uh, So uh, as well. The flip side of that coin is we have medicines that can make you gain weight. We'll come back to that so I can get you there as well if you're too skinny. Uh, if we have mood disorders, which are very common as we get into adolescence and adulthood with epilepsy, we know some of our medicines kind of actually help with mood control. So we often pick from those. Psychiatrists use many of these more than we do. Uh, and if our patients have other medical conditions, so if they're in oncology, if they have any kind of tumor they're being treated for, if they have cholesterol issues, we want to avoid some of our older medicines because they can actually be lethal because of their effects on the other medicines in that population. So it's obviously something we really try and avoid. All right, so we know medicines, this is a big one, usually as we get into adulthood, that can increase weight. Most patients don't want to go from the person on the right to the person on the left. Uh, but we know some medicines that can do that uh, very well. So in general, most of our patients, uh, and I put a female on here, it's interesting, we talk to our adolescents and young adult male patients, since I'm in California, I can say this. If we talk to them and say, I think this medicine will work for your epilepsy, you may gain some weight. All the, the adolescent or early adult males think of Arnold in his prime and think of, oh, this is what happens when you gain weight. <laughs> you just are, it's all muscle. <laughs> and as they get older, they realize that's not the case. <laughs> but when they're younger, that's what they all think of. Uh, females, even from the get-go, realize that's not the case. So usually these are deal breakers here, even if they would be effective options because people don't want to do that. Um, the flip side of the coin is if we want to go from, you know, being maybe a little bit heavy to lighter, uh, we have medicines that will help with that <laughs> as well because weight loss is a side effect for some of these and if they're appropriate then sometimes we say do we start there and then obviously we have a lot of weight what we call neutral medicines so you don't shouldn't do one or the other uh, with them as well all right what if you also have mood or I'll call it psychiatric other background other than the epilepsy that's as well uh, we know some of our medicines that can potentially worsen that. And again, potentially doesn't mean it has to. It just means it's maybe a little bit more likely. Uh, and we know some that potentially can improve it. Uh, unfortunately, we have plenty of patients that don't read the books and do the opposite. <laughs> so again, these are not 100% rules, just you know, something we think about as we look at these choices and try and figure out how do we get from one to the other. Um, the other thing we would like to have uh, that we don't have. In an ideal world, uh, if we're in the middle of this uh, kind of slide and we, you know, seeing however many number of patients that is, uh, I would like to have some way to test whether it's genetic or otherwise and say, wow, you know, I think this medicine would be good for you because you'll metabolize it normally. It won't cause you to gain weight. It won't cause you to have a mood problem based on your individual genetics. And we do the test and voila, you're off to the right side of the slide, you're happy, the medicine's working, you're not having problems. Unfortunately, we're really not there yet. We're more like on the other side of the slide, which is kind of we try the medicine. Uh, hopefully you're in this group, which is happy you're not having that. Uh, we have folks that not go in the top and bottom where they do have issues uh, that we maybe couldn't have predicted in advance. We say, okay, we gotta move on to different medicine. Uh, we're probably further along the line of sorting this out with some of our medicines and how they're metabolized, if you will. So not so much as far as picking the right medicine, but kind of like, okay, if you metabolize this differently, I have to adjust the dose. You can still use it, but it may mean if you metabolize it faster, for example, you need to be on more medicine. If you metabolize it slower, you need to be on less. You can still take it. Uh, so we're further along with some blood tests to help us out uh, with that. Uh, we're way behind uh, our colleagues in oncology, for example. Uh, most oncologists, once they know what kind of tumor you have, won't even start treatment until they do the gene typing because their therapy is 100% based on the genetics of the tumor and of how you metabolize their drugs. They're, they're way ahead of the rest of the world of medicine uh, that compared to literally every other area, uh, I think, with that. All right, so I've kind of told you that, you know, hopefully we're guided by seizure type, but I've just alluded to a couple other things. There's a long list that hopefully uh, the doctors are thinking of as they're kind of picking medicines uh, and going through this in their head quickly. Obviously, one of them comes in, I'll not just mention, is cost. If it's not on your insurance plan, or if it is, but it's at a higher level, that's often a deal breaker, too. <laughs> For many families, we get that. You go from a you know, 10 or $20 copay to know you pay several hundred dollars a month. That can be a real challenge, obviously, as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just like uh, families, physicians have no control over that. <laughs> We're all at the mercy of our own health plans with that. Uh, and a lot of that ties into regulatory status of how the drugs are approved at a national level by the FDA. Uh, that's gotten better in recent years, 
uh, but it still is there. So I've tried to just break down a bunch of our drugs. So if you look at age groups, so infants, kind of infants to adolescents and adults, you can see like, okay, which ones are approved, which ones are approved as add-on. Monotherapy just means you can use the drug by itself. And you can see that most of these are tested in adults. We get a little better in adolescents, we get to infants, and it really gets pretty dismal. So most of our drugs that we use in infancy, even though there's a fair number uh, that we use, are not quote unquote approved, if you will. Uh, and sometimes the uh, insurance plans use that to not pay for them, even though there's lots of data that says they work there, unfortunately. So we sometimes have to kind of you know, provide that information to them and kind of you know, go to bat and say, this is the medicine we really need to get, guys. All right, and then the question that always comes up after either on one medicine is, how do we make decisions if one medicine is not working, if you need to end up on more than one medicine? How do we kind of walk through that logically? Uh, and I think most of this will make hopefully logical sense to you. So we figure out kind of what's the next best medicine, medicine for that epilepsy type or syndrome. If you've run the, you know, we pick the first choice, we figure out, okay, which of the other ones adds to it well, what mixes, if you will, what plays together well with it, uh, what doesn't cause side effects uh, that can work together well. Uh, we, we start a schedule and slowly increase it, right? And as you might guess, if we start to slowly increase it, and in that first couple of weeks you say, oh, the medicine's helping, I'm doing better, uh, that's probably intuitive that if you have an early response, that's good. <laughs> uh, it's, it may seem like intuitive, and if you have uh, no response at all, even early on with most of our medicines, uh, we get the most kind of bang for the buck, if you will, at modest doses. So most of our patients respond there. We have very few patients that don't respond at all to kind of low to medium doses, and you get up to high doses, and they're tolerating, and they go, wow, now I'm doing great. Very, very rare, almost unheard of in the modern era. So usually you can figure this out very early on. Um, the benefit for patients is if you're worried about a side effect, since we can figure this out very early on, it's well hopefully before there's any kind of you know, some of our side effects are longer term use or take longer to develop, you can figure that out. Uh, if you're having them or not having them, you're good. But if you're an early responder, then we say, okay, this is easy. The new medicine seems to be helping you. Uh, if you're better but not quite seizure-free, let's go up on the dose and see if we can get there, right? So this, this is somewhat logical, I guess. Uh, and if we do that and you're seizure-free, that's where we want to be, then we may say, gosh, should we back off the dose of the first medicine? because you weren't seizure-free on that. Uh, and maybe we can get by with a lower dose of that. Depends on the medicine. Some patients say, you know what? I didn't have any side effects at all from my first medicine. Uh, we've added this in. I'm not having any. I don't want to change anything because I'm finally doing great. I'm happy sitting tight, which is very reasonable. But many folks, we pushed up the first medicine kind of you know, to good levels in an attempt to get seizure control, didn't get it, or maybe having what I would consider uh, nuisance side effects, so they're a little bit tired, you know, they're maybe a little bit at the end of the day, they say, you know what, if we can go it down a little bit and keep seizure control, I wouldn't mind doing that to get rid of some of my side effects, so that's an option, so if we're not having, and the AEs is adverse events, so that's these kind of nuisance side effects, so if we're not having those, we can always go up and try and get seizure free, if we're um, not having any AEs um, and we're not seizure free, you know, then we kind of say, okay, let's keep the good one. So if the one we added is helpful uh, and we're better, let's keep that one and maybe back off the first one and look at now do we add a second one and go through the same kind of exercise again. So hopefully there's a logical kind of system of how we approach this as well. Uh, so um, a lot of food for thought of how we select a medicine. A lot of options uh, go into this, uh, more than you might think uh, as well. Let me see if these will all come out. Oh, I guess I have to clip them all out. So we try and get there. I mean, we're looking at all these things. You know, I didn't mention laboratory monitoring. Some of our medicines require, you know, that periodically, which depending on um, how you feel about blood work can be a good thing or not a good thing, <laughs> kind of as well for our given patient. Uh, so we go into a lot of different things and we kind of think about what medicine. Uh, but our goal is obviously to kind of get, uh, you know, we've done all that to get to the best medicine. We don't have one size fits all, but trying to individualize our approach so that every patient's uh, doing better. And again, realizing that, yes, for many of our patients, we can use medicines and get to where we need to be. With the ones that don't, there are other options uh, available. And even with those folks, we still have to think about this because we're always combining those with medicine for the most part. So we still kind of want to use some of this to say what's the best medicine. All right, so thanks so much, I appreciate it, and hopefully I left enough time for questions. Happy to entertain those.
Kiddingly going to say, I thought you were telling me that was a good side effect to have <laughs> in an adolescent male, but okay. <laughs> um, so this is interesting. The FDA has changed their approach, uh, went back a few years ago, because historically, and rightfully so, um, we have some disasters uh, in our country and in Europe, so won't just blame us, uh, but with uh, before current uh, testing, if you will, of animal models of medicines that were given to females while they were pregnant uh, that caused effects on newborn babies. So it led to a lot of changes decades ago in kind of regulatory status and how we think about those, driven obviously largely towards females, and that's where it sat appropriately for a long time. In recent years, and this has literally just been the last couple of years, uh, pre-COVID, um, the FDA said, oh, maybe we should think about like male and female. <laughs> what a concept, right? Because <laughs> uh, they're different issues. Um, so, uh, and a lot of the male stuff is, quote unquote, much easier to test in animals as, as well too than some of, I mean, we, yes, we look at some of the female issues, but they may not translate as well as some of the, the male related issues. Um, most of our medicines, as far as any kind of lasting effect on sperm or affecting the sperm, we don't really see that. Um, there are some that can cause issues in the male more related to impotence or some that even can affect sperm motility, like if you're trying to get pregnant, but nothing that's like, okay, this is going to be some kind of toxin that's going to affect that, that's going to then affect your baby, if you will, from the male side. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the research and concern is more from Correct. But what about, so the article that I read, I recall some of it, was like, it may or may not have permanent effects, like regarding sperm toxicity. So yeah, so so your question about, you know, affecting sperm, so if it does, usually what just happens is it means it's harder to achieve pregnancy, because you may not have as many sperm that are effective, if you will, but the ones that actually are effective are fine. So you don't create a problem for the baby. Yeah, and it's easy to test that in the mail, obviously. <laughs> but well, are, are there, you know, like if if we kept him on the medication for a while, so he's seizure free now. Yeah, not a problem. And then reduce it later than. I don't even. You, most you don't even have to reduce it, because yeah, there's it, that's it, you, it, most of the time it's not clinically kind of important because you know if you normally have you know pick a number you know a hundred thousand sperm and you reduce to 90 you still get pregnant <laughs> so you only need one right <laughs> so uh, so usually it's not yeah an issue it's, it's a very incredibly rare patient rare enough that they actually get reported as a single case kind of in the old days because it's just so unheard of almost yeah other questions go ahead Yeah, so not everybody heard a question, I'll repeat it. So great question though. So um, it was about kind of a child who's been seizure free for many years now, but EEG still shows abnormalities. So in general, there are a few exceptions. None of our medicines treat the EEG. <laughs> they don't fix EEG, they treat seizures. They're, that's why they're anti-seizure medicines. There's a rare exception to that. Uh, infantile spasms, our goal is to fix the EEG because that's probably what creates the problem more than the seizures. Um, and you can argue absence of epilepsy, we'd like to fix the EEG as much as we can too, but that's probably a Western society issue because if you grow up in most of the planet, you don't treat absence seizures even. In most of the population of our planet because most of the population lives in India, China, and Africa. <laughs> and there, they're not even treated. <laughs> so it's, it's more of a kind of learning and other issues why we strive with that standpoint. But with uh, our common seizures, and actually if we go back to one of our best drugs uh, for many years, carbamazepine, uh, you can be seizure free, but it can actually make your EEG look worse, if you will, even though you're doing better. <laughs> so our drugs, yeah, definitely don't fix kind of regular EEGs, if you will, yeah. The, the way it probably helps us more 
is if we bend seizure free and we still have an abnormal EEG, again, depending on what it is, that usually makes us think, okay, we need to stay on medicine longer. We're not ready to come off, if you will, because if we did, we would go back to having seizures. So that usually kind of helps us more with that decision regular, rather than do we need different medicine. Yeah, great question. Fine. My son has Yeah this, is, yeah, this is, yeah, this is the challenge we all have, is trying to figure out um, seizures that uh, do not cause impairments, so that are, you know, feelings, whether it's an aura or some other feeling, uh, typically with regular scalp EEG, so EEG on the top of your head, uh, we literally would never expect to see a change. It just doesn't happen. So we, so if that's all the patient has, and they ask me, like, oh, will the EEG help figure this out? I'm like, no, because it's going to tell me. It's not good. No, it's going to show nothing, which won't help me <laughs> figure this out. Uh, it doesn't uh, help with that. What probably helps us the most, um, and the way we kind of back into that diagnosis, is if we have a patient that's having those on medicine, if we kind of say, okay, let's take you off medicine, we do kind of longer term EEG, and you have that same aura, for example, and then you go from that to immediately to a seizure where you are impaired, and then I do see the EEG change, then I can at least say, aha, okay, this is exactly what you're seeing at home, I'm now seeing it, and off medicine I'm seeing it progress to a clear seizure on the EEG with impaired awareness. So I can say, okay, this is the kind of beginning of the seizure that I don't expect to see the EEG change on scalp EEG. Um, and you're right, those are often challenging to treat. Uh, it's uh, kind of one of the good news, bad news things, right? It's good because you're not impaired, so you don't necessarily hurt yourself, fall down, have other problems, but it's bad because you're aware of it. If you're the patient, so you keep thinking like, oh, this is not good, I'm gonna have a big seizure. Uh, and you're aware, so it's, uh, it's tough, but they're often very challenging to treat. We use our focal seizure medicines, but they're often, yeah, uh, challenging, so, yeah. Other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I'll repeat her question, maybe try and explain a little bit. So and I think there's a whole, I think that's actually following me. There's a whole symposium on ESES. So um, this is a very unusual epilepsy, uh, only in childhood, and um, where basically kids can have some seizures, but that's usually not the big problem. The big problem is that they have deterioration in their school and cognitive abilities. And when we look at EEG, typically when they're asleep, they're just having continuously abnormal EEGs. The key is, um, we know a lot of uh, children, when they go to sleep, uh, can have a more active EEG, if you will, which is why we often try to get EEGs to capture sleep. Um, but the vast majority of them will not have any change in their school performance with it. So in the modern definition, if you will, of this, uh, we say you don't have it just based on your EEG findings, you have to have kind of worsening of kind of school and cognitive function as well. That's one of the times that if we see that, you're right, we actually are trying to treat the EEG. Uh, again, do we have great medicines to treat EEGs? No, so that's the problem. We try, but I mean, we really don't have medicines that are even approved to do that. <laughs> I mean, we have, you know, things that have worked historically, but it's really very uh, kind of anecdotal about this is what we try uh, because none of our medicines are approved to treat EEGs. That's not what they're kind of designed to do, if you will. <laughs> so it's really tough. We try different things and there's different reports of kind of different kind of uh, therapies that we don't use for most seizures that are used often there, but it's tough. Uh, and if you go back in time, before people even treated those, it kind of went away on its own as you grew into adolescent and adulthood, which is why we don't see it in older kids or adults. It just goes away on its own. So we try and fix it because of the cognitive issues. Don't get me wrong. It's worth fixing. <laughs> but we know that, yeah, we just struggle with good choices there. Yeah, great question. All right, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the short answer is I wish I could, but I do know the story of how that got started because <laughs> I happen to know the, the mom that actually started this story. Um, so the short answer is we don't know how B6 uh, helps uh, with Keppra, and I'm not sure it does to be candid because uh, we don't have any controlled trials that have ever looked at that, uh, that does it actually help or not. Uh, but this got started because uh, there was a mom 
often a mom that drives these things, right? <laughs> Whose child had tough to treat epilepsy, um, was on Keppra as one of the treatments to treat uh, seizures, and uh, was still having seizures. And the mom worked in a hospital um, as one of the person that did the kind of blood draws and brought the blood back to be analyzed. And so in her spare time was uh, working away on the computer to say what else helps seizures in young children, because their child was two or three at the time, and saw, oh, there are some young kids that have vitamin B6 responsive seizures. And she said, gosh, my child's never been on B6. Maybe I should try that. So she put her kid on vitamin D6, and the seizures did not get better, unfortunately. He didn't have those. But she thought his behavior improved some and told the local neurologist, who started putting lots of other folks on it, uh, and then it spread throughout the community. Um, I can tell you the rest of the story, because I happened to see this kid when he was about four to five. Um, he did have a focal cortical dysplasia. We did epilepsy surgery, and he became seizure-free. And when he became seizure-free, even Without the D6, his mood was back to his normal, happy-go-lucky self. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's one of those weird things. I don't know that it does anything, but it's there. Um, if you take a multivitamin, which you recommend for most of our patients with epilepsy, they all have B6 in them anyhow. So most of our patients are already on it. Yeah. Other questions? All right, listen, I appreciate everybody's attention, and uh, you get uh, some of your time back if you're staying for the next session. A few minutes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>